Greetings from the blessed Michael McGivney Pilgrimage Center in New Haven, Connecticut. And thank you for your interest in today's online presentation about baseball, America's pastime. Earlier this week, uh, which Tuesday, March 29th, to be precise, the Knights of Columbus observed its 140th anniversary. To those of us members, we refer to it annually uh, as Founders Day, an occasion of honor for Father Michael McGivney, who founded the Knights of Columbus. His legacy endures in not only the organization he founded, but also in his personal life and his example. Blessed Michael McGivney had a holy life, but he also had a very human life. And he also had an affinity for the game of baseball. He used it for not only personal recreation, but he also used it as a means of uniting people, of bringing together common interest as well as common mission. My Knights of Columbus colleague, Andrew Fowler, shares Father McGivney's attraction to the game of baseball and has researched and written extensively about a weaved history between the Knights of Columbus and the game of baseball. Last fall, the McGivney Center premiered the first of four segments of an online exhibition on the KFC connection with that game of baseball. And today, what was originally scheduled to be opening day for Major League Baseball is the debut of the second segment. Andy Fowler joins me now to share some of the details about the updates to the show, the, the second base uh, segment. Thank you, Andy, for ensuring that I receive a dose of baseball today to ease my cravings. <laughs> well, thank you, Peter, for welcoming me back uh, to discuss all there is about the Knights of Columbus and baseball. And a special uh, thank you to all those who are watching both or listening uh, live or in, later on YouTube. I mean, th there is a lot to explore in what we're calling second base or part two of the exhibit, uh, KFC Baseball and American Story, but I hope to give you the best bits or at least a taste of what's uh, what you'll see in the exhibit coming up. Andy, can I ask you before that, maybe just give a little overview to the whole exhibit and touch again on what you covered in uh, the first segment, first base. Right. Yeah, so um, actually I have a slide right here for, uh, for, uh, for just a quick recap. So, so uh, yeah, so to quickly recap first base for those who are not aware, uh, the Blessed Michael McGivney Pilgrimage Center released part one of four during the MLB playoffs last year, as Peter mentioned. And this explored the beginnings of the order's relationship uh, with the game, specifically linking it back to the Knights of Columbus's founder, Father Michael J. McGivney, who played the game and used it as a, as a tool for bringing the community together and thereby being an avenue for uh, evangelization. And the Knights were quickly drawn to the game you know, forming competitive leagues around the country and into parts of Canada, uh, which built up intra-council uh, relationships. Uh, and not only that, but first base also explores famous knights in the majors, like Connie Mack, John McGraw, uh, Jim O'Rourke, uh, who made a significant impact on the game, becoming the the quote-unquote shadows, if you will, of uh, that the current players are chasing. Uh, so part two is a little different in the sense that we're moving away from the game's uh, infancy and an American society that's uh, that was mostly isolationist uh, and moving into a period where both the game and the United States took a major step onto the international stage. But this was also a period where the game itself would see a major power shift uh, from the pitcher to the batter ending uh, what is now known as the dead ball era. And for those who don't know, uh, I'm sure most of you who are listening know, uh, the, the dead ball era was an era typically of not only low scoring games, but also just primarily small ball. So there weren't too many home runs in this era, but one man pretty much changed all of that. But this is also sadly a time when baseball faced a near death experience in the public eye, but you know, more on that in a few minutes. But uh, so that's a quick wrap of first base. It's online still, um, and you could go check it out um, maybe even before reading a uh, second base, but from there, I'll uh, go into where where we start. Andy, can I just interrupt for one moment? I yeah, want to sure. invite listeners, before you get started with your presentation, I want to invite listeners, if you have questions at any time during the presentation, there's a utility on the right side of your screen, a question mark, 
you can use that to drop a question in, in writing. I'll monitor that, Andy, throughout the process and then at the conclusion of the presentation, I'll uh, select from those questions and we can have a, a short session of Q&A. Great. And with yeah. that, I will turn everything entirely over to you. Well, th thank you. So, um, so just we start from over there, which is a reference to the classic World War One song, oh, over there, over there, uh, George M. Cohen um, song. But uh, so really before, only a few days before the 1917 baseball season was set to begin, which was April 11th that year, the United States of America declared war on Germany and more than 4 million uh, civ uh, citizens would eventually serve in the uh, American Expeditionary Forces and approximately 200 of those were major league baseball personnel, including Knights of Columbus like uh, Urban Red Faber and uh, Harry Heilman. But unlike the USO in World War II, the United States government was not as equipped to undertake the providing of creature comforts during the First World War. So this relief fell onto organizations like the Knights of Columbus who built these, these huts, as they call them, across America and Europe, manned by secretaries, referred to as Casey's, uh, with the motto, everybody welcome, everything free. And that meant everybody, and uh, regardless of race or religion, which, you know, is pretty pretty progressive at the time. I mean, as you could see here, uh, this is an all uh, African-American team from Camp Zachary Taylor donning KFC baseball uniforms. So the World War I effort was a significant operation by the Knights of Columbus. And it's interesting to see these echoes, the echoes of these huts, uh, on the Polish-Ukrainian border that now serve refugees of war um, in Ukraine. But one of the comfort soldiers sought at that uh, during World War I was, you probably guessed it, was baseball. And the Knights answered by supplying thousands of gloves, bats, baseballs, enough where apparently 5,000 games were played a day, according to the Columbiads, which is the Knights of Columbus magazine prior to Columbia. And as I mentioned before, the KFC Casey's would help organize games and even teach it to their French counterparts. But probably the most uh, famous and significant uh, Casey was future Hall of Famer uh, Johnny Evers. Uh, by the time the United States entry into World War I, uh, Evers, who had won World Series titles with the Cubs and the Boston Miracle Braves in 1914, was in the twilight of his career, although he would play again for uh, in late 1920s, but, but at this point, he was a man without a team in 1918. So he asked the order to send him overseas as an athletic director, uh, and the order agreed, uh, agreed. And, you know, as you could see here in this quote, he would later, uh, later write, believe me, I'm mighty glad the Knights of Columbus accepted my offer. I feel as though I can do great work in France. And uh, I would say he did uh, pretty good work in France, to say the least, but and he did teach baseball to French soldiers, including uh, General Paul Vidal. I, I hope I pronounced that right. But Evers did more than organize ball games. He actually went out into the field, as it were, and brought supplies to troops during which he was under fire, as reported in the Columbia edit. I mean, you could see here um, some of the headlines that featured Evers in Columbia, as well as a photo of him with uh, troops. He's in the center in the back. Uh, and one of the, those servicemen is actually his former uh, Braves teammate, Hank Gowdy, who's on the far right over there uh, in this top in this top photo. But uh, but Evers would not be the only knight to serve as a KC. Uh, that also included uh, Scranton Bill uh, Coughlin of the uh, Detroit Tigers, Jack Hendricks of the St. Louis Cardinals, among others, and even Huey Jennings. Uh, who who was part of the Detroit Tigers as well, was slated to serve as a KC, but the war ended before he was shipped off overseas. And there is a great Columbia article that was written a few years ago uh, by baseball historian Jim Leak about the Caseys and their work and, and their baseball work. So um, that is linked and referenced in this exhibit. So just a special shout out to him. But... But while uh, baseball made a, a small step outside of North America, in part due to the Knights of Columbus, the national pastime suffered a significant blow at home with the infamous 
Black Sox scandal. Um, I mean, you might know about the Black Sox scandal from like the movies like The Field of Dreams or even Eight Men Out, but the scandal has its roots for, for those who don't know, uh, uh, with eight players of the White Sox who felt definitely felt undervalued and underpaid by the team's owner, Charles Comiskey, who was a actually a reported member of the Knights of Columbus. But these players eventually turned to nefarious gamblers, specifically Arnold Rothstein, to throw purposely lose games in the 1919 World Series. And as a reward, they would get a percentage of uh, the action, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, and Comiskey, though, portrayed himself as a benevolent team owner to his fans. But according to his players, he was too cheap to even pay for his team's uniforms to be cleaned. So the players wore the dirty uniforms in protest, hence the nickname Black Sox. But the 1919 White Sox were, uh, were favored, I believe, to win the World Series against the Cincinnati Reds, despite the latter having a better regular season record. Um, however, they eventually lost the series to the Reds, who were managed by Knight of Columbus, Pat Moran. And rumors spiraled that a fix on the series was in even while the series was happening. Apparently, Moran um, confronted his own players, warning them that if he suspected anyone of fixing games, he would toss them. But the game's reputation and integrity in the eyes of the American public really was on the precipice of disaster. I, I mean, this cannot be overstated. I mean, but this was a widespread concern and the, the, because the public felt like they were being cheated. Um, and you, I'll show you some cartoons in a little bit uh, about that sentiment. Uh, but some of the players also felt cheated. Uh, I mean, eventually indictments were filed against the eight conspirators with Knight of Columbus and White Sox player John Shano Collins being denoted as the wrong party in the, the scandal. And this is the indictment that eventually led to the uh, 1921 trial, the people of Illinois versus Edward Sakati. Uh, Sakati, who is one of the eight. Um, and it also should be noted that there were other members of the Knights on that 1919 squad, but none of them were among the eight. And uh, the, even the Knights of Columbus went out of their way in Columbia Magazine to repeat that fact because uh, apparently there was there was fake news out there claiming otherwise. I mean, you, you see it bold right here, no black socks here. And they really wanted to stress that point, especially to the youth as th that first word suggests but but the trial was held as i said in the summer of 1921 and the eight were acquitted by um a jury however the next commissioner base the how about how, sorry excuse me the commissioner of baseball judge kennesaw mountain landis permanently banned them from the game and uh comiskey for his part did pay clean white Sox players as if they had won the world series although the scandal did hurt his reputation, um, but nevertheless, Comiskey was voted into the Hall of Fame in 1939 as an executive. But baseball historians often credit J uh, Judge Landis's harsh decision as salvaging the game's reputation, but what the game needed was a hero to draw fans back, to make them forget this infamous uh, episode in the game's history. And that hero was none other than the, you know, the Sultan of Swat, the King of Crash, the Colossus of Clout, the great Bambino and Knight of Columbus, George Herman Babe Ruth. And uh, kudos to any anyone out there who got that Sandlot reference. But but anyway, um, Babe Ruth is probably the most important, one of the most important athletes in baseball and sports history. And um, to me personally, I see him as the first sports figure who truly transcended beyond the game in which they played, becoming an international icon. And I assume I'm not the only, uh, I'm not alone in feeling that way. But you know, he's been written about, studied, dissected in almost in almost every way, shape, or form of media. And his feats on the diamond are legendary. You know, 714 home runs, 60 homers in a single season. He has the best all-time wins above replacement among the countless records he still holds. And if he didn't transition into a Hall of Fame hitter, baseball historians would still place him in the Hall. As a pitcher, he was that talented. In you know, in short, you know, what more could be said about Babe Ruth? That hasn't already been said, right? I mean, he is the standard in baseball that every player has measured himself to. But to me, actually, and this is what we explore in second base, the most fascinating aspect of Ruth's life is his arc, how his life mirrors that of the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, because 
you know, the Knights of Columbus to back up is all about faith formation, you know, helping men, uh, help men helping other men live faith-filled lives because what matters most at the end of our lives? Records are the state of our soul, right? And by the end of Ruth's life, it was the latter to him. He wrote about this extensively in an article he wrote for Guidepost right before his death. Um, but he starts out that piece saying he had a rotten start in life, uh, soaking in the atmosphere of the saloon his father ran in Baltimore. He was deemed an incorrigible child and a delinquent, uh, skipping school, roaming, roaming the streets, getting into trouble, and even drinking alcohol at a young age. And he had difficulty listening and obeying authority figures. Uh, but because he was incorrigible, um, Ruth's parents sent him to St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys, which was a reformatory and orphanage run by the Zaverian brothers. But it was one brother, Brother Matthias in particular, who Ruth respected. Um, brother Matthias, as you could see on the, the right-hand side, uh, was a big man, apparently six feet, um, at least maybe six inch inches, and saw a raw athletic talent in Ruth, drilling into him baseball skills. Uh, but Brother Matthias also drilled into Ruth the importance of faith, and his own example apparently had a, a lasting impression on Ruth, who wrote, quote, he could have been successful at anything he wanted in life, and he chose the church. But it was in 1919, uh, Ruth joined the Knights of Columbus with Pierre Marquette Council 271 in South Boston. And though he struggled to practice his faith, that's putting it, uh, that might be an understatement in the decades to follow, um, Ruth often collaborated with the Knights of Columbus in charity events and barnstorming tours in the off season. And he was known for attending mass and being a prayerful man. Um, but the Knights, for their part, recognized his talent um, and popularity from early on, with his council sponsoring Babe Ruth Day on September 20th, 1919 at Fenway Park, which turned out to be his final home games as a Boston Red Sox. A, the Boston was hosting the Chicago White Sox uh, for a doubleheader that day. And fun fact, in game one, Ruth hit his first walk-off homer and tied the single season home run record, which was 27 at the time, if you could believe it. And this photo here, I know it's kind of blurry, that it's a, actually a video that you could see in the exhibit. Um, it, it shows Knights between games one and two of that game handing Ruth uh, US Treasury certificates worth $600 in his honor. Uh, but a few years later, in 1921, uh, Ruth worked with the Knights of Columbus to restore St. Mary's Industrial School after it had been damaged by, uh, by a fire. There were fundraising ads in the Columbiad, which referred to Ruth's stats, such as, quote, like, uh, Babe Ruth's batting average, how many will equal in dollars, 385. And, uh, and reportedly, then Supreme Knight James Flaherty stated, quote, if every knight who has seen the Babe make his, uh, make his home runs would get back of St. Mary's Industrial School, it would soon be rebuilt. And uh, the knights even conceived this gimmick there's like relay gimmick of having Ruth swat the quote longest home run in creation with a ball traveling from St. Mary's grounds to San Francisco for the Knights of Columbus Supreme Convention in 1921. However, sadly, there's no mention if the gimmick actually happened, but uh, Ruth for his part did uh, tour around. He brought uh, a band from uh, St. Mary's to baseball games to raise money, but, but Ruth's, most consistent work uh, with his brother Knights came after the major league season ended, uh, conducting conducting uh, barnstorming tours across the United States and even into Canada. And since no major league team at the time that Ruth played existed past the Mississippi, these tours were perhaps the only opportunity for Westerners to see baseball stars, to see major league baseball stars. And local KFC councils would be on hand to greet the babe when he arrived in town and hosted dinners where he talked shop about baseball, but more importantly, councils sponsored exhibition games Ruth played in um, as charitable opportunities. For example, as um, you could see in this card um, here, uh, it's an exhibition game in Stockton, California, and it was sponsored by the Knights, and the game, the funds for the game benefited their Christmas charity fund. Uh, another fun fact, these tours were organized by Ruth's agent, Christy Walsh, who is a member of the Knights of Columbus, um, and considered the first sports agent. So 
the Knights were heavily important in actually bringing the game to cities in the American West by way of Ruth's popularity. And additionally, Ruth did a barnstorming tour in Japan in 1934 that helped grow the game's popularity outside the United States, even inspiring the creation of Japan's first professional league in 1936. But Ruth throughout his life, um, he was known as a charitable man, uh, particularly to children, visiting sick children in hospitals, talking to kids about the game and so on. And on one occasion, he and, Luth, uh, he and Lou Gehrig, uh, his New York Yankee teammate, stopped at Boys Town, which was an orphanage in Omaha, Nebraska, and talked to them about the training he received at St. St. Mary's. And fun fact during it, that, Boys Town was managed by Fodward Edward Flanagan, a, a Knight of Columbus, who is on the path to sainthood. And you'll be able to see that photo in the, uh, in the exhibit. But you see, Ruth uh, was more concerned about teaching children about the faith, specifically writing and guideposts. He wanted to give children the quote unquote works in religious education. Um, he further equated the soul and religious education as a quote, solid little chapel, explaining quote, it make it dusty from neglect, but the time will come when the door will be open with much relief, adding, but the kids can't take it if we don't give it to them. I think he realized his own neglect for his solid little chapel. And he spoke about how he made a full confession toward the end of his life, saying the experience was, quote, a comfortable feeling to be free from fear and worries, adding, quote, I, can now, I now could simply turn them over to God. I, I think it's this act uh, that making his full confession and reversion to the faith after a life of uh, exorbitant tastes, to put it mildly, uh, that is the greatest lesson that we could take away from Ruth's life. Uh, for a person who struggled uh, obeying authority figures, he would go on to say that, quote, God was boss throughout his own life and that um, God had an eye out for him. I, I think especially during Lent, uh, this message tr truly resonates that God never abandons us, even at times we may abandon him. So maybe we could pray uh, that Ruth's best title is not the Sultan of Swat or the Colossus of Clout or even the Great Bambino, but maybe, dare I say, Saint? I don't know. Well, one could only hope. But with that, um, there are plenty of more neat nuggets and factoids I could go into, including a legendary headache, um, a Pope's interest in the Knights of Columbus baseball program, and a night training a dog who became a baseball team's mascot. But suffice it to say, I hope you enjoyed this talk and I hope you have a fun time exploring second base. It was a pleasure to research and write. And I'm so grateful for the Blessed Michael McGivney Pilgrimage Center for allowing me to share this interesting history with you all. So um, thank you. I'll turn it over back to Peter if there are any questions. Andy, we thank you as well. We enjoy your research. We enjoy your enthusiasm. And it's a fascinating story to imagine that Really, during Father McGivney's lifetime, baseball was beginning to emerge. You you cover that quite extensively in the first segment. Yep. And then how uh, throughout the course of history, right to the present day, as we'll learn as the, the series advances, uh, baseball has remained united. But the most famous of all baseball players and uh, arguably among the most famous of all Knights of Columbus is... Uh, is Babe Ruth. Um, there were a couple of uh, a couple of comments or questions that I'd like to to go through if I could. One yeah, sure. question was, um, I think it was more of a statement, but uh, surprise, um, you know, that we had five thousand baseball games uh, played, and that's an amazing number. I I acknowledge. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's so weird to see. When I was doing the research, I I just I couldn't believe it. Uh, there is a there is a little snippet. I, I I believe it's in the photo gallery of um of the exhibit, but it's uh it's yeah, truly fascinating of how the enthusiasm for baseball and how the enthusiasm for the Knights to provide that. Because like in um I, I think I sort of mentioned it in the first presentation of of, of first based how how during the Civil War, it was baseball was a distraction, and that's how it grew uh, exponentially in, uh, in America. And uh, to see it sort of that, you know, the history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. 
element playing up again in World War One, especially with baseball, is it's um, truly fascinating. Well, to be sure, the Knights of Columbus had um, these recreation centers or these huts, as you referred to them, yep. uh, on training grounds throughout the United States. And as is noted uh, previously, there were only militias at the time that the U.S. declared war in 1917 with Russia. So we, we had to form an army as a nation. And so there were many of these uh, training camps today, the, the army and the various other military services, the armed forces have uh, very large training grounds in specific places throughout the country. But at the time, uh, they had multiple ones. So it's not uh, it's not unimaginable to think that if we had 50 states and, and um, you know, 50 uh, different training camps, that there might be 10, 10 baseball games taking place on each one of them on a given day. I do know there was a hut out in Alaska, I, I believe, if I remember, but I, I couldn't remember seeing any baseball games. The furthest that I saw baseball games being requested for were at, was actually in Panama. Um, Panama and I believe Haiti were, um, were some of the spots that um, soldiers were requesting uh, KFC baseball um, mm -hmm. supplies. Um, another question was regarding your reference to uh, Johnny Evers. Now, some people know uh, better the name Johnny Evers. It's the same individual. And yep. uh, so the question was, is this, is this the famous uh, Tinkers to Evers to Chance? Uh, what it do is. they call that? Base, baseball sad lexicon. The sad lexicon. Right? Yep. Uh, the, <laughs> I guess the worst poem. Uh, I mean, the I mean, be, best poem, but I mean, it's the the worst uh, double play combination that I guess people could hear. But yes, that is the same Johnny Evers. Uh, and, I, uh, and I believe Tinker was also a Knight of Columbus. I'll have to, I, I saw that in the Columbia ad, but so we had two, two out of the three. Uh, who were uh, that, that members famous of the Knights that same, yeah. on the on the uh, on the Cubs? Um, I think it's important to know, and this is just something that I made note of as we were going through um, World War One and the emergence of uh, Babe Ruth and popularity contributed a great deal to the growth of the Knights of Columbus. Now, you pointed out that he was in many ways a savior of the game of baseball after the Black yeah. Sox scandal, but in truth, uh, the Knights of Columbus had uh, a coming out, if you will, after World War I. They had been around for 40 years, more or less, up until that time, but their involvement in World War I with the American soldiers, both domestically here as uh, the army was forming and, and training, and then while they were deployed overseas, both uh, in France, predominantly during the actual fighting and during the occupation period after in the short uh, time after the end of the war in Germany, uh, you know, so many Catholic soldiers learned of the Knights of Columbus through that outreach to them. That's yep. uh, what was a precursor to the modern USO. Yep. And as a result, the numbers of members increased exponentially. In fact, it went from uh, roughly 400,000 members at the conclusion of the war to uh, double that, almost 800,000 members by the end of that decade, the, the, the 20s. So I think the popularity of the Knights of Columbus and their outreach to the Doughboys and then uh, our, our beloved babe, uh, who you know, was, was known even then as, as a Knight of Columbus, helped yep. uh, to propel interest in, uh, in the organization. Um, there's a question with regard to um, integration in uh, mm -hmm. in the game of baseball and in, in society. Now, you showed a, a photo of um, an African-American team, um, and this was a team supported by the Knights of Columbus. Evidently, they're uh, wearing KFC uniforms, and this was on a, uh, a training camp, as we yep. noted, in Kentucky. But um, can you expound a little bit on how um, you know, baseball as well as potentially the Knights of Columbus uh, help to integrate immigrants and, and uh, black communities uh, and how it helped their advancement in society? Well, I would say it, that's actually a topic I 
we'll explore more in uh, third base. But there was an article that we came out with uh, that I don't know how many people are who are listening are members of the Knights and received Nightline. But I actually wrote a story a few uh, back about a month ago now about the Knights helping out trying to integrate baseball. There, the aforementioned uh, Jim O'Rourke, who was a Hall of Famer, uh, he created a league in Connecticut and ha had a team in Bridgeport. And he actually hired an African-American um, minor league player. It's, I think one of the first minor league black players either from Bridgeport or there were some claims that he could be in the entire, you know, <laughs> baseball. Yeah, it, it's just, it's interesting to see that early example. Uh, there's a later example of John McGraw trying to uh, uh, integrate baseball, try to break the color barrier um, with Charlie Grant, who he dressed up as a uh, Native American at the time, just to, to get him past uh, the censors, if you will. Uh, but it didn't pan out. But later on, there were several players from the Dodgers who were supportive of Jackie Robinson, or who were critical ally, early allies for Jackie Robinson. And one of them was Eddie Stanky, who initially didn't really he had reservations, let's put it, as uh, against Robinson. But there is a very famous incident early on in that season where Stanky stood up against the Philadelphia Phillies manager who was cussing him out and said, you know, I, I think it was the exact quote is, uh, I bet one of you louses can't fight him or you know, something to that effect. So there were several nights, at least along the way, who tried to um, integrate the game. I mean, this is sort of one minor example of uh, this team. Uh, donning KFC baseball uniforms. But at the time, the order, there was no uh, restriction within the order's charter that prohibited blacks or, or, or any American for that matter from joining the order because it's, you know, it's a, if you're Catholic, you could, if you're a Catholic man, you could join at the time. But um, at least in terms of the, the whole organization's charter. But it's, uh, yeah, it's in, the Knights were critical uh, in terms of integrating. Um, immigrants in American society. I mean, we have early on Father McGivney himself trying to help uh, the widowed and orphaned of Irish immigrants. Uh, that's really primarily why the, the Knights of Columbus was founded. So there is this long history of the Knights, uh, of Knights helping out, um, try, try to create a, uh, a, a better society, a more fraternal society. And uh, baseball is just a very small picture, small episodes in the, in those, but, um, yeah, it's it's evident even in that, I would say. Andy, we have a question asking about some other uh, famous baseball players who are knights, but I, I think okay. before I let you answer that, I I, I guess I want to prepare people that there's going to be uh, more baseball players introduced in in coming editions of the exhibit, and we we refer to uh, some still in the in the first exhibit as well. So. Andy, you're welcome to to share names of uh, famous baseball players, but uh, we also don't want to uh, discourage people from uh, following the exhibition. And I'll say that the next episode is planned for the All-Star break, which normally comes in, in mid-July. And then the fourth edition or the fourth segment of the exhibition will again be toward the the playoffs we debuted as andy said the uh the first edition last year just as the playoffs were getting underway and so we'll plan to do uh the same again uh in this baseball season i want to give props to uh a knight of columbus who is sending us greetings andy from panama uh, <laughs> obviously central america is a very popular place for uh the game of baseball so uh, Brother Knight, thank you so much for joining us today from Panama. Uh, yeah, to the best you. of my knowledge, you uh, you win the prize for being the most distant uh, participant in uh, in our webinar this afternoon. It's a good thing then I brought up Panama then. <laughs> Just <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So Andy, I'm very grateful once more. Uh, I want to say I failed to do at the outset. This session is being recorded. So for those of you who are watching it and um, would like to share it with others, you're welcome to do so. There were other sessions, other uh, webinar sessions that uh, Andy uh, graced us with at the beginning of the first segment of baseball. So you're welcome to go to Michael McGivney Center.org, Michael McGivney Center, 
www.baseballexhibitionlive.org and you will find the baseball exhibition there, the online exhibit. Uh, there is both uh, part one and part two and you'll see uh, webinars that you can watch from uh, past presentations so you can enjoy those as well and some more oversight on the on the involvement we will i will post this recorded session on the michael mcgivney center youtube channel so people can enjoy it today and i'll i'll just note for those who will be watching it on a recorded session that this, today is march 31st 2022 uh ostensibly the opening day of baseball andy you have uh preserved that status uh, for those of us who are true fans. And let me also say that only in the Knights of Columbus could you see a civil discourse between a Red Sox fan and a Yankees fan on opening day of I know. baseball. Oh, so. the, yeah, the, the next, uh, what, April 7th is going to be a maybe a, a difficult weekend for us, but we'll make it through. <laughs> Indeed, we will. So, Andy... Blessings to you and blessings to all who have joined us today. Uh, please visit michaelmcgivneycenter.org to see the exhibit and share it with others. And stay tuned for the next segment, which will appear, as I said, as we approach uh, the All-Star Game in mid-July. Until then, viva Jesus. Thank you.